the fight against dogmas is something that we all should be con concerned about. It's very high tech here, like that, hopefully. The, the dogma is something that uh, I used to consider from uh, the religious point of view, political and so on. And then I realized that in medicine, we are so filled up by dogmas that it's a uh, big, big issue for me. Uh, and I would like to share with you a little bit some of the lessons I've learned of after some 25, 30 years in, uh, in surgery and trying to fight dogmas. And you have to remember that the truth in medical practice was the state of the art at that time. It's not static, it's not static and Ken was commenting on that earlier. And I would like to tell you a little bit in order to understand the journey that I've been through uh, that opened my eyes for the existence of these medical dogmas. And uh, it was quite interesting. In the beginning of the 1980s, I was a young resident in surgery and the normal way of handling a patient after having performed a total gastrectomy was to have the nasogastric tube, or the, the gastric was there, but with the tube for seven, eight days, do the barium contrasts, check, and all that, you know. And then suddenly there was this patient with a severe psychiatric disease. And he had this operation done, came out of the anesthesia, and the morning after, I met him walking around in the walkway, long away from his bed, and the tube was away, nobody could really stop him because he wanted to walk around. And he was happy, no problem. And we tried to get him back into the, you know, the room, the hospital has to follow the rules and the bed, he should be in bed. Uh, and then I saw that he had been drinking coffee not only one cup, but you know, some people love coffee, so he had been having several cups in the morning. And we all realized that it would be quite impossible to put down the nasogastric tube again, it wouldn't be possible to have him stop drinking coffee, water, whatever, and he even ate normal food. And we said, this is going to be a disaster. And after five days, he said, please, can I go home? And so he went, no problem at all. That was a sort of eye-opener. Why is it that he could do that and all the other patients were lying in bed for, you know, five, six, seven, ten days? And then in the same period, uh, there was a patient who was admitted with an acute abdominal uh, situation with an ileus. And then I read his old medical record written with pen and all the old-fashioned correct way and he had been operated upon some place in the 1940s and they had done a total gastrectomy and their nursing charge were so clean and he had started systematically drinking sugar water from the very day after uh, or the same afternoon as surgery because they didn't use IV fluids. So they had managed this total gastrectomy without IV fluids. And I remember showing this to the head nurse and saying, why, why is it, how come that they could do that without our IV fluids? That was in the period that we were using TPN on all gastrectomies and so forth. So it was quite interesting when we read those first reports from uh, our colleague in Western Denmark, Ib Hesso, who published uh, in the mid 80s that people being operated upon for colorectal cancer, they uh, could have food shortly after the operation. And that was sort of telling the story that the dogmas, the state of the art, probably wasn't the state of the art. So this was the sort of background. <clears throat> and in 
And you, you know, th there are so many dogmas. We have been with, within the ERAS society working with the, that the bed should patient come out of the bed just to walk out of the operating theater. Yes, that would be the most optimal situation for any patient. And all the things with the tubes and the drains and the f fasting. I mean, the fasting is such a stupid thing. Uh, we all know it today. Uh, but it's, it's quite strange that we, we went on for a hundred years taking patients into a surgical, a physiological, huge stress, putting them on something like a marathon or something like that. And how did we do it? We fasted them. Would anyone try to run along the walkways of the can without having their bottle of water with them? Well, we did it that way. It was quite fascinating. So, in my view, the challenges, the challenges are really to identify and look, look for the dogmas in a, our daily practice, because they are there. Still, we have them all over the place. And then the other way we must address this is to get hold of knowledge. And that's why this ERAS society and the database will and is so important and that the basic scientific research is so important. And then it doesn't, it, it's not enough with the knowledge. We have to implement and make the change. And over the years that really has become to me much more difficult than obtaining the evidence. The change, it was, it is so important, so difficult. And then a little bit on, on other things about the dogmas. Is it that the, the, the fear of change is inborn? Or is it that the owner of the dogma, like the political systems or whatever, they are in control as long as they can keep the dogma alive? And it's also such that the doctors and nurses are be better than the politicians and the, well, who, had, who had theirs might be interested in control. And then it's the industry, the money makers. The dogmas, they generate income, an income in a broad sense. A little bit about this inborn fear of change, which probably is something that we, we all have. We, all animals, we do have it. It's within our deeper central nervous system. What we know is working is safe, and that's why we don't make the change, even though the change is obvious very often. So there is something in our biology and psychology that really keeps us away from making changes. This must be uh, kept in mind. I think it's one of the important issues to keep in mind. And then the control that the doctors and nurses, maybe not consciously, I'm not saying that they, they do it to be bad to the patient, but the control is something that we like and it gives us power because nobody else can challenge the way the doctor and the nurse and the other healthcare professionals are handling the patient, which leaves the patient without control at all. And this is a major issue for the future. And then we have the industry, <coughs> because the industry, the industry, what is the industry? It's not an innocent bystander. Industry is there to make money, to have us work and all that. It has to be there, but the main incentive is to make money. So we have to realize that there are situations, for example, where uh, the industry uh, produced products may be uh, looked upon as much superior to the ones that we could produce ourselves. For example, the, the Nestle or whatever kind of industry versus a normal diet. IV fluids versus water, like in the patients I told you about. So industry makes money, 
doctor in control and patient is not in control. That's a bad situation. And then the, the, the most effective way of making a change is to combine a mechanical device, device made by the industry, doctors, especially surgeons, and some capital. They will change the habits we are working with very quickly, very, very quickly. And just to finish a little bit on this issue, we have another big dogma. We are always saying that we don't have enough money. Why is it that we don't have enough money? Well, there are reasons why, and sometimes we don't have enough money. And there are situations today, for example, even in Europe and in Western societies that we have trouble with the money. I do realize that. But it's also often, at least when the society is running normally, that it's a way to put the blames somewhere else. And it's fascinating to look at how we make change when it's in respect of clinical practice. The implementation speed is very slow. It's very slow. It's this fear of change. And then if there's something like a technical gadget, like a robot, for example, it moves like this. In few days, you can change the practice if you have a technical device. Giant leaps. And it's always combined with optimism. It's quite interesting that those technical innovations probably will give much less benefit for the patient than some of the other changes in behavior that should not cost anything or even might be cheaper than the technical uh, innovations. And another aspect of handling the patient. We all know that we are quite bad on taking care of the patient from the very beginning of the symptoms of a disease until fin finalizing uh, the treatment and the follow-up. And the work with patient pathways is something that is, in my view, super important to make the journey and make the treatment the most optimal. But that kind of work is not as nice or funny or interesting it won't you you will never end up being a surgeon having your name connected to a procedure like like Bildrot operation one doing pathway work it's not going to make you famous at all but it's going to help the patients a lot so that's another issue the the implementation problem is much bigger than i thought it was when i was younger and even not so very young. It's really in the last 10 years that I've realized how difficult it is to implement something that should be obviously easy to implement. And one of the reasons also is that so many persons will lose control and influence. And in order to achieve a change, those people must understand, feel, have the, have the understanding, the, the, the inner side of them, feel that the change also is a victory for them. If we cannot succeed with that, the change will never happen. And here comes a slide that is taken from all sort of implementational work. You know, uh, and I've stolen this or been given this from Dr. De Jong and you will see it also later on because this is the fundament I think. It can be written or drawn in different ways but you have to make a plan. You have to do something and then you have to study or monitor or measure the results of what you are doing and then act according to what you have seen and observed and then replan, re, 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 redirect, English isn't that easy, is it? Uh, and then do this repeatedly. And I thought in the beginning that if I had a good plan, we had several people involved, we all thought this is the way of doing it, we started and then it would be fine. And then you realize that, well, it isn't like that. We think that we have done it, but if we don't measure, we won't be able to see whether the success is there or not. 
This is a important clue. And we all have to change behavior. As you know, surgeons and anesthesiologists, we are completely dependent on each other's work. We have the patient, but this blood-brain barrier, which is so famous amongst us, it's, it's really not a joke. It's a serious problem, because if we are unable to be working jointly with the patient in the focus, if we keep working in silos and boxes, we will have trouble making the journey for the patient properly and uh, efficiently. So this has to be really changed. Surgeons have to make their ideas about anesthesiologists in another way and vice versa. This is a clue to enhanced recovery work and to anything else. And then we also have to remember that when we started this work 10 years ago, we sort of saw the situation, the knowledge, the evidence at that time. And then in five years, in 10 years, 50% of the medical evidence is changed. So the ERAS concept must always be in movement. And Ken said that in, his, in, the, in the inaugural uh, lecture. And I think this is going to be one of our major issues. And that's why everybody out there really has to, to apply and work making us able to have new knowledge. Because otherwise, we'll just be another gang of dogmatics. Uh, so it's, we're gonna, we have to repeat this. We have to do the same story. Study, act, plan, do, study. That's the clue. And we need the data. And as you know, with the database that we have today, uh, it's not perfect. It will be better. But it's one way that we can see how our implementational work is done. And we can have a, a, the results at hand for what we know is important for the implementation uh, activity. So 20 years after the story with the patient and the medical record of that old history, uh, finally we were able to publish this in a sort of evidenced way. I was very happy that people then could believe that what we said was not just a dogma. And then this has to be repeated and repeated. Studies are just the knowledge at this time. And then with the perioperative care changing, new studies have to be done in order to be sure that the evidence, in fact, still is valid. So <coughs> I'm summarizing to fight the dogmas. You need strong personal conviction. Don't just think or, you know, you have to say this has to be changed. And then you have to have a lot of thick skin because they, they are out there, all of them, that don't like the idea of making a change. And you must find young people. And I'm not saying young people in the sense of uh, age, even though that often hangs together. But if you listen to Henry Kellett uh, next lecture, you will realize that age per se is not a problem. And we must find those early innovators to have them on board when they are making the changes. And it's quite important not to be dependent on industry. That's my view of it. And you need some friends. And you are hopefully my friends for the future. And we can all be friends when making this kind of uh, work that we are embarking on. And also, remember those dogmas. There are millions of them. Medicine is full of them. And if we are not to become some of those dogmatics, we must stay updated and change our protocols all the way along. Because the dogmas, they will always be there. And we will be sitting there, or hanging there, or standing there. The only way out 
you must fight them. You must fight them. It's not dangerous. It's funny. And it's very important for the patient. Thank you.